My name is Peggy Sterling and I did not plan to speak, so I don't know that I have a whole lot to say. But I was in D.C. yesterday and uh, if any of you know, the occupation of D.C. started. Uh, yesterday there was actually some people there before then, but the official opening of it was yesterday. And I want you to know I thought it was a wonderful sized crowd. I don't know how many people. Uh, it was peaceful. Um, as far as I could see, there was no trouble with the police. Um, I think the D.C. police are a little bit better at these things than the New York ones are. Um, so, what can I tell you about it? I had a wonderful time. I encourage you all, if you get a day, a week, or whatever, I plan on going back often because we need the presence in D.C. D.C. is a central point. Um, and you know, that's where the president is, and that's where our government is. So if you can come to D.C., we had a march yesterday. We marched, uh, oh, there's also a group in Lafayette Park, I should let you know. And uh, the march, uh, we joined the group from Lafayette Park, and we went to the uh, Commerce Building. Um, and we let them know what we thought about things. Uh, had drummers and yelled at them and any bank we passed we kind of let them know what was happening. Uh, it wasn't a very long march but uh, I don't know I think it's a good day. There's food, Food Not Bombs is feeding people up there. Um, porta potties, you're comfortable. Um, please come and just let people know that you don't like what's going on, that we've got to change our government, and that you're in solidarity with it. And also that uh, these wars that we're fighting, that cost a fortune, just a small, just three days from that could probably feed Africa, if I understand right. So, uh, this is such a waste of our resources. You think about how much oil, just the materials that go into killing people. Um, I ask that you come to DC and let people know there's better things to do with our money. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. I spoke a little bit earlier, but I didn't really get a chance. Oh, I spoke a little bit earlier. I don't know if everybody had a chance to hear what I was saying. Um, Can't hear you. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. check. Mic check. <coughs> I spoke here earlier. I spoke here earlier. Oh, with the microphone. With the microphone. And some of you probably weren't here. And some of you probably weren't here. But now I'm here. But now I'm here to convey this important information. To convey this important information. One conversation. One conversation has the power. Has the power to change how you think. To change how you think about everything. About everything. Are you ready to start that conversation? Are you ready to start that conversation? Yes. Are y'all familiar with social entrepreneurship? Are y'all familiar with social entrepreneurship? No. Yes. No. Okay. For those who are not aware. For those who are not aware. You don't got to do a mic check. I'll speak louder. I'll speak up louder. Social entrepreneurship, well, let me get back to it. Traditionally, we have two ways of doing business. We have for-profit and non-profit. For-profit is all about money. Non-profit is all about meaning. Social entrepreneurship is in the middle, where you use enterprise as a medium to make social change. Because if you think about it, everything always goes back to the money. So if we use our collective economic power and self-organize, we can create the change we want to see instead of putting our dependence on corporations and government. And that's what social entrepreneurship is about. It's saying, do you have a problem with this? Do you have a problem with this? Do you have a problem with this? Let's self-organize to make it happen. And the biggest problem, or the source of all our problems, 
is capitalism or this manipulated currency, the dollar. And it's centralized because the Federal Reserve has a create a monopoly in the creation of the dollar. They get to control how much money goes into the economy and how much is taken out. We need money for the for our livelihood. So indirectly, they control our livelihood. Now we no longer need a middleman for our currency. It's, it's, a, it's a thing called it's a thing called mutual credit. Mutual credit is a people created form of money, and um, it's not being you know exposed to the masses. There's 2,500 different local communities around the world doing this, but it's not being covered. And for example, back in the Great Depression, when um, this town in Austria called Wargo, it was like 30% unemployment. The mayor implemented a local currency, which means it's like just like Ram bucks, but only can be spent in the local community. So it's so basically with the dollar, it has no loyalty to Richmond. So say when you go to Walmart and spend that money, that's leaving Richmond. We need to support local businesses because you spend locally. It's guaranteed to come back to you. If you produce, we have to pr start producing stuff. We outsource everything. You see what I'm saying? We, we, we place all our dependency on outside countries and outside states. We got to start uh, uh, locally producing stuff, sustainably and passionately producing local goods and services. And um, Labor Day 2010, I created an economic model called Producism. And Producism is an economic model that gives people the opportunity to create the change they want to see by sustainably and, pr and, and passionately producing, consuming local goods and services using this form of local currency called mutual credit. And um, we're, we're using, we're taking the same approach that Facebook did, where basically targeting college campuses and students creating their own economy. So we ask you, what do you produce? What, do you, what are you passionate about? Are you a photographer? Are you a builder? Are you a, a teacher? You know, you can produce stuff and we can trade this local currency with each other and start becoming self-sufficient and start uh, becoming more prosperous for ourselves. And, um, I have some flyers to share with everybody so you can check it out. And if any interest, we're starting the beta program here at VCU. Start with like 50 to 70 students, then expand at different colleges, and then um, eventually open up the, the network to the entire community. So thank you and thank you for listening. Everybody. Hello. This is my second time up here today, and I'm sorry for hogging the floor, but it just occurred to me that I've talked on behalf of the organization, but I've never talked on behalf of myself. I, uh, we want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> thank you. Now, the one thing that really drives me about this uh, organization that, is that there isn't a leader. There's just everybody's opportunity to speak out, and that led me to think about the story of the disabled. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I have a couple crutches here. <laughs> That'll make it real good if anyone tries to cuff me. <laughs> Let's get that on camera, please. Yeah. But um, essentially, I started having attacks when I was 18 years old, younger than most of you here today. We didn't know what it was. Just something would cause me to just pass out. My world would turn upside down. Not that I knew at the time because it would have been illegal, but it would feel like if I had been out drinking all night and had a bad case of the spins. I just thought this was something to do with the flu, and I got the flu a lot. I have an inner ear condition called Meniere's disease. It's invisible. It throws off your central balance system. I know this is all boring to you, but basically, I bounced from doctor to doctor to doctor until I was 34 years old. Nobody could diagnose me because well, with, without insurance and without proper uh, records and everything like that, it just was a stack of symptoms and not a pattern. Essentially, I found out when I was 34 years old what I have and that it had gone on too long undiagnosed. I couldn't be treated. I was told I wasn't going to be able to work anymore because there's no way to predict what's happening. Uh, when I'm working, because stress is a factor, I have to call out sick two, three times a week a standard 40-hour work week. I do believe that if this government gave us a better health care system, and this society believed in those values, that would not be in the situation I am in today. But that's not the end of my story. It's not. There's more. There is a lot more. 
Now, when you're declared disabled by the medical community and you are told you cannot work anymore, there is supposed to be a safety net in this uh, country called Social Security. You should be able to just apply and give them the doctor's notes and take the payments that you paid into the system. Yeah. Unfortunately, it is currently the system of Social Security, sometimes because of fraud, yes. But usually just because it's their nature. They deny you the first time. They deny you the second time. They deny you the third time. The fourth time, they lose your paperwork. So you have to apply all over again. Then you go to court. And you have to get a judge to say, well, this makes no sense. You shouldn't be here at all. So now we're tying up the judicial system. Three years after I was diagnosed, I was finally awarded my first Social Security check. Luckily, I had a private insurance carrier through my employer that I had signed up for a disability. If it had not been for that, I would not have been able to feed my family. I received payments from an insurance company, and that kept my children in a house. That kept food in our bellies. But it gets better from there. That was a year and a half ago, 2010, when I got my first check. But my wife still has to work. Unfortunately, she lost her job in August. We are now depending completely on my Social Security, which is roughly $1,200 a month. I don't uh, mind telling you that. Uh, my kids could have gotten more if I had longer work history, but I don't, because I couldn't. And from there, uh, we may do, but the problem is when she lost her job, she has become a full-time student again. Luckily, financial aid doesn't count because it's a loan and has to be paid back. But here's something that I found a little bit messed up. We went to apply for food stamps to make sure that we can continue being fed while my wife looked for a new job. They officially said that she did not qualify because she does not make enough money to get assistance <laughs> eating. You have to have a 20 hour a week part-time job, which many of you know as students is impossible to get these days in a lot of cases, especially for a 34 year old mother of two. And don't you dare tell my wife, I told you her age. <laughs> she has a 34 year old mother of two with a disabled husband. She has to work around the class schedule. A lot of companies say, well, we have a lot of people that don't have class schedules. I'll be happy to work these 20 hours a week. So we'll use them. The other thing would have been a work study. Unfortunately, since she's at a satellite location from ODU at John Tyler on the south side, she doesn't qualify for one of those either. So there are officially people in this country that ask for help feeding their families and do not qualify because they do not make enough money. That's something I am here to change. This is not my only issue. I have a lot more just as everybody else does. I do not expect anyone else here to stand up for me, but I thank every one of you for helping me have an opportunity to stand up for myself. Maybe we should let the brother know that we will stand up for him. We will yeah. That's kind of the whole point, isn't it? We've been standing up for ourselves individually a long time. Now it's time to stand up together. Yeah. Woo! Be real brief. My name's Phil Valedo. I'm with the Defenders for Freedom, Justice, and Equality. It's a Richmond community organization. Um, you might have heard of the burial ground struggle. Uh, took 10 years to beat this institution and to take down their parking lot that was desecrating one of the oldest black cemeteries in the country. But we beat them. Yeah. We beat them by arousing the community so the community could beat them. That's what it was. Can't be one group, can't be one individual. Uh, just here in solidarity, we'll be doing a story on this gathering and this movement in the next issue of our paper. The Virginia Defender will be out October 27th. We'd like to invite you all to come down to the African Burial Ground down at 15th and East Broad Street on Monday at 6 o'clock for a celebration. That's October 10th. That's the date in 1800 when the great slave rebellion Gabriel was executed at that spot in Richmond. Gabriel who organized the most extensive and well thought out conspiracy to overthrow slavery in the history of the United States. Had been for terrible rainstorm, 
They might have succeeded and changed the course of history. So every October 10th, we gather to show our respect for Gabriel and his comrades. Please come down and join us. Keep this movement going. I heard last night you didn't have a, a, a sound system, so we brought a little sound system with us. But you got one today. See, that's growth. We got a little larger one if you need it for the next time. But let's get this word out and build this movement. And thank you so much for standing up. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I spoke earlier, kind of killed my throat with a very angry speech. <laughs> but um, I realized that I was speaking on the personal side of things, not the systemic side, which also needs to be addressed. How many of you here are VCU students? You should all be a part of Students for Social Action. Give me your email address, I'll get you on the mailing list. Uh, the president for Students for Social Action, um, Alex uh, Vasquez, uh, isn't here today. She had to uh, teach a class. But uh, Students for Social Action does a lot of things in the community. It's a really good club you guys should all join. Second point, how many of you here are not registered to vote? Register to vote. Please. That is your biggest weapon right now. Can you do that with Young Democrats? Yes. Go to the Young Democrats. Go to the Richmond Public Library. You don't even have to be a member of the library. You walk to the library and say, I need to register to vote. They hand you a form. Awesome. You're registered. Uh... Yeah. There are so many different ways to go and get registered to vote. There's, there's no excuse not to. It takes like five minutes. Please. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be brief. I want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, organizing this today and coming out. Um, I'll tell you one thing that bothers me um, about the university is that we tend to not understand that the reason why things don't go the way that we want them to go is because we don't know how to organize ourselves. Um, as soon as we learn how to organize ourselves, I'm already yelling. As soon as we learn how to better organize ourselves, we can see things come into fruition. Um, as you all know, the Student Government Association uh, is an organization on campus that is doing its very best uh, to speak volumes um, about student issues to administrators. Uh, many times we don't get the message across because of the fact that we don't get you all to come out and tell us what's really going on. Um, that's why I'm here today. I want to let you know that you do have conscious people in the Student Government Association, that the establishment is not just about the status quo, but we do shape it many times. And there are very few of us within the organization who do shape the status quo, but that's why we need more of you to come and voice your opinion. All right? Um, as you all know, financial aid, I'm a financial aid, I'm a graduate student. Um, financial aid is basically non-existent for a lot of us. Um, I think less than 10% of students at BC actually qualify or get uh, financial aid, which is ridiculous. Um, however, what this means is that we have to find other ways to fund our education and to keep ourselves in school. We have to find ways to retain each other. And the way to do that is to work together and to figure out how we can get this more community, you know, community banking focus, um, community lending focus. We need to start getting a, an idea about the gift economy. We need to start getting an idea of how to sustain one another through one another. Um, and not so much depending on uh, Big Brother, right? So, I don't know if you all, you already spoke to, Drew, Drew Little already spoke to y'all, but Drew Little is one of the most amazing men that I've ever met in my life. Um, everything that he stands for, producerism, social entrepreneurship, um, is what we need to really start understanding and what we really need to start um, moving towards. And he stands for that. Um, seriously, he, he, he stands for that. I think we need to get his message out, and I think we need to understand his message a little better and be able to interpret it and, and translate it um, to any, any and everything that we do in our daily lives. Um, I'm going to wrap up by just saying that, again, I am here for you, um, these two students. I really want to see more of our voices heard. And if you guys ever come to the SGA office, and I'm not there or anyone else, please know that you can contact me online. Um, I'm the Chief Justice right now with Lawana Chambers. You can contact me through the website or you can contact me with my personal email. 
And whatever it is that you want to see coming to fruition, please know that I am here to advocate for you and on your behalf, and I'm happy to do that. So please feel free to contact me. Lamarna Chambers is my name again, and thank you for coming. Yes, that's right. Look, I'm a little older, but it's, it goes a little slower, but I'm sure. Look, I want to remind you all about this voting. When she spoke about the voting, I worked at the polls during a big election with Obama, and what really shocked me was the fact that thousands upon thousands of people registered to vote at DMV. Now, I feel like there was a scam because when the people came to vote, their names were not on the law, okay? So if you want to vote, I guess you're going to have to go to the Department of Elections or go somewhere other than DMV, sign up more than one time because thousands of people were actually turned away and they registered at DMV all over the state. So my thing is, how can they make a mistake like that and have all of these thousands of persons that actually signed up, brought all their documentation, but they were not on the poll books? We need to ask questions. You're young, you're learning. Ask questions, be vigilant, do not give up. And some of you all will have to divorce your families because they from the old school, but they are not right about what they're doing. They're not right about who they're following. It's going to be up to you all to change their minds. Old is good. Old can be fantastic. The wisdom and the knowledge that is passed down to us is powerful. Like this young man right here, I'm trying to get him to come up here and give us a few words of knowledge. I just met him, but he's powerful. Go to the older people, talk to them. I work with people 70, 80, 90, 100 years old. They count. A lot of them can still think. They can tell you about the true history of Virginia, which is nothing to be proud of. There's a lot of racism still going on. And on this campus, it was always quietly kept. But it's a live thing. We need to learn to embrace and love each other so that we can make America the best place in the, on the world in the world. That's it. <laughs> but uh, I'll give you my wisdom for today is that sometimes I wish I were younger and maybe some of you wish you were younger someday but that's a mistake and some of you Wish you were older, maybe. That's a mistake, too. The thing you should remember is that you're the right age. Doesn't matter what it is. That's the age. And that's the size. And that's the face. And that's the body. That's for today. So the thing is to make the most of it at this moment. That's it. There are no problems with you worrying about a bunch of stuff. What happened yesterday 
What is going to happen tomorrow? We don't have to worry about that. Just this moment, we're going to do the best we can for ourselves and for everybody else. And so that's my sermon for today. Thank you. So here's something I want to know. Why is it that the child poverty rate in Virginia is the highest child poverty rate this state has had uh, in its history? Why is that? Who can answer that? Capitalism. That's right. It's capitalism. But I'll get more into that later. Um, the child poverty rate in Virginia is around 14%. The national average is around 20%. And it's probably higher. Uh, statistics can be quite doctored, as we've seen with the unemployment statistics in this country. We all know unemployment is a lot higher than the government says it is. But anyway, the national average is 20%, the state is around 14%. In Richmond, in Richmond alone, the child poverty rate is 38 point something percent. That's higher than both the state and the national average combined. In Alexandria, it's 17 point something or another percent. Forget the points, it's 17% of children living in poverty. And a lot of people are living so close to the poverty line, but not below it, but close to it, that if they were to get sick, if they were to get into a car accident, lose their job, uh, stub their toe, they could be thrown below the poverty line. And yet, at the end of the last fiscal year, Virginia finished with a $544.8 million budget surplus. And most of it's sitting in a rainy day fund. Now, rainy day funds are great, but not when you have an emergency. That's and if right. we have the highest child poverty rate in history in Virginia, that's an emergency. We need to tap into it. Yeah. But instead of doing that, we're going to give $7 million to the police and $7 million to the military. So we would rather spend $14 million uh, to jail the poor at home and bomb the poor overseas and we could be spending that yeah. million dollars, That's 14 right. million, to, to create jobs, to create jobs to lift the families of these children out of poverty, to create jobs in public transportation, to better fund education, um, for social services, for after school programs, for Planned Parenthood, for all sorts of things. And yet, we are gonna spend all that money on these millions of dollars worth of cruise missiles to murder innocent Libyan civilians. You know, I just want to know, like, all the old people, they're like, oh, it, it was never like this. And so if that was the case, I want to know what happened to this country. To be honest with you, it was probably always like this. They were just better at hiding it in the past. That's right. And now that all this stuff is out in the open, it shows our strength. Our numbers might be fewer than we'd like, but our quality and our fighting spirit is just wonderful. And we are just strong. That's right. That's right. But anyway, I'm petitioning to redraw the budget so that we can help these kids and lift them above the poverty line, creating jobs so that their parents can better support them and to, to cut spending on war and prisons. Yeah. And, uh, my petition, I have it here with me today. I'm petitioning on behalf of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. And when, when I turn this petition in to whoever, to the House of Delegates, to the governor, they're probably just going to throw it in the trash. 
because that's what they think of our opinion, that's what they think of your opinion, that's what they think of the regular working man's opinion, and that's why they're trying to bust unions, which is another reason so many people are in poverty, because they don't want you to have workers' rights. So, all I'm saying is pretty much, don't, don't trust the government, rise up, occupy everything. Thank you. Woo!